Welcome to Approximation Algorithms and the lecture on summaries for ordered datasets. My name is Rasmus Pei. We'll start by looking at a motivating example and then look at several solutions to summarizing ordered data. QDigest and dynamic countmin are both for the case where data is from a fixed domain, whereas the KLL summary works for any ordered domain. As a motivating example, consider a set of timestamps. This could, for example, be clicks on web links. We want to be able to approximate the number of timestamps in a given time interval. A classical approach of summarizing data of this form is to use quantiles. Suppose there are n elements and consider them in sorted order. To construct the quantiles, we take every epsilon n elements and store them. For example, if we set epsilon equal 0.1, we get the 10%, 20%, up to 90% quantiles in this way. The quantiles require linear space to compute, but only 1 over epsilon space to store. Now consider the rank x of an arbitrary element in the domain x, which is defined as the number of elements in the set less than or equal to x. We can approximate the rank from the quantiles with an additive error of at most epsilon n. We want to achieve something similar while using space close to 1 over epsilon. There are two settings to consider. One is where s is a subset of a fixed domain, say 0 to u minus 1, and the other one, s can come from any ordered set. So we'll consider the former first and the latter uh, in the last part of the lecture. But before we go on to discuss the summaries described in the book, uh, let's consider why we don't just use sampling, right? So we saw last week that sampling is a powerful primitive for estimating all kinds of things. We can take a random sample from s, and intuitively it would kind of spread relatively easily, uh, evenly across the, the range. And we could use this to try to estimate ranks. So in particular, if we look at the random sample R, the expected number of things that are less than or equal to X is going to be some number times the rank of X. And this number is K over, over N, where K is the size of the sample and N is the, is the number of elements in the set. Inverting this, we could approximate rank as n over k times the rank in the sample. In the exercises next week, we're going to see that this doesn't give as good as a solution as we would like. So the size of the sample needed to make this work is considerably larger than 1 over epsilon. So first we consider the so-called Q-digest summary. Here the assumption is that s comes, the elements of s come from this domain of integers from 0 to u minus 1. And we're going to assume that u is a power of 2, and this is without loss of generality. If u is smaller, we could simply round up to the next power of 2, and that would cost us essentially nothing. Now, to describe the data structure, it's instructed to imagine a complete binary tree with u leaves. So this is not actually going to be stored, but this is just a conceptual thing. So here it is for u equal to 8. So the idea is to store in some of the nodes in this complete binary tree counts of elements that appear in that subtree. So the leaves, of course, correspond to all the possible elements of, uh, of the set. If we have a count in a node, we don't actually know exactly where this count comes from. So to avoid making too large mistakes in the rank bounds, we want to avoid storing counts that are too large. So we are going to limit the counts that we can store to some number c, which is a parameter. So suppose we insert 2. We tr try to store the count as high as possible under this constraint. Okay, and in this case, an empty data structure, um, we can store it all the way up in the root node. Okay, so let's consider another insertion, maybe three. We go up as high as possible, we could store it in the root node. 
And here I'm just using unary counters because it's it's easier to 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 draw. So let's uh, consider another insertion and now let's actually set the value of c to 3. We have another 2. It's also recorded in the, in the root. Now we have a 5. So we cannot insert that in a root because that would violate the maximum count. So we have to insert it um, one level below. That would that would be overflow in the roof in the root so to speak. So we go down to the next level and put it in the in the right child of the root. Similarly, if we insert zero, it also goes to the left child of the root, and so on and so forth. One thing that can happen is that everything is full all the way down to the leaves. So we make an ex exception to the rules. Leaves may contain counts that are bigger than C. This is not a problem because for leaves we have exact information. We know exactly what this corresponds to. Now, I would like you to think about how this can be used to estimate rank of x, and also what is the error in terms of c and u. The way we have described it, the QDIGS can go, grow quite large. So there is a need to reduce the size. The value of c needed to ensure an epsilon n error is epsilon n over log u. This grows with n, which means that capacity can arise as the number of elements grows. We can observe that if most of the nodes are within a constant factor of capacity, then we actually only need log u over epsilon node, which is only a logarithmic factor from the size of, uh, of the quantiles. So we somehow want to ensure that most of the capacity is, is actually used. So initially we might have c equals to 3, but at some later point with more elements inserted we might have c equals to 6 and we won't want to, a lot of nodes are suddenly under full and can have more capacity. So the idea is to compress the data structure by moving counts up okay. in such a way that if your parent is, is not full, you move a corresponding count up in order to fill it. And this may empty some, some nodes and save us space. So the invariant after the compress is that all nodes that have a count, uh, non-zero count, less than c, have a parent with count c. And this means that the total number of nodes is going to be, with non-zero counts, is, o, is going to be O of n over c, as we wanted to. If we do this periodically, we can maintain order of n over c non-zero counts at all times. The next uh, summary we are going to look at is the so-called dyadic count min sketch. In the book, there is a discussion of the dyadic count sketch, which is exactly the same thing, except that count sketch is used rather than count min, but it works essentially the same way. The idea is to use a count min sketch to compress the counts in a complete binary tree. So let's consider the complete binary tree. Each time we insert something, we are going to record the count at every level above. Okay, so before it was only represented at some level, but now we actually add to a counter at every level all the way up to the top. So we can have a lot of non-zero counters. So this would be a problem if we stored it exactly, but what we can do instead, if we index the nodes in some way, for example using binary strings, that we can store the counts in a, a sketch. On an update, we want to increase the counts of all the nodes on the path to the root from the, from the leaf corresponding to the inserted elements. This corresponds to all prefixes of the binary representation of the element. So trivially, if we would just store this directly, we would need to store the number of distinct strings, which could be huge. But with count min, we can basically decide the space ourselves, and we are going to get an approximation of the counts. 
We want to choose the space such that the error is at most epsilon n over log u. And each estimate should hold with probability 1 minus delta over log u as well. If we can do this, then we can use a similar technique as before to estimate the rank of any element in the set. If you work it out with the L1 norm of, of the data set we insert, it's at most n times log u, because we insert log u elements for each um, in the count min sketch for each insertion. And the space works out to be a polylog factor times 1 over epsilon. And as I said, this uses the fact that the sum of all weights is n log u. This is not a tight bound, it can be improved, and you can see the book for that. Next we are going to look at the so-called Carning Lang Liberty or KLL summary, which has become quite famous and, and widely used for summarizing ordered data. It works with any ordered domain. So it doesn't have to be integers in some range. And this also means that we are not going to get the dependence on the log of the range size, as we saw before. The data structure is a sequence of lists, or so-called buffers, that are each stored in, in sorted order. So the sizes of these lists is, uh, are geometrically growing. And we have a total number of h plus 1 levels numbered from 0 to h. And each level is a factor of 1 over c bigger than the previous one, where c is a parameter between 1 half and, and 1. And this is, of course, approximate because the exercises are, are integers. But we'll assume that they grow by a factor uh, exactly 1 over c except the, the lowest level. So we might go down to size 2 and we won't go any further down. So the intuition is that elements at level L are going to represent 2 to the L elements in the input. We can insert new elements at level 0 corresponding to 2 to the 0 elements and then we are going to move up elements to the next level when the level is full. And this is a so-called uh, compress or compaction step. Um, and what we need to do here is to discard half of the elements. In this way, each element that moves up corresponds to twice the number of elements as before. So let's look at an example. Let's suppose we have a buffer at some level with in this case, eight elements. Now we are going to choose between two possible lists of elements to move up to the next level. So either we take all the odd numbered elements from the list in sort of order, or we take the even numbered elements from the list. So it's some kind of, uh, of sample, but it's kind of highly structured. So let's think about how this affects rank. So we start with elements that each represent 2 to the L, or have weight 2 to the L. And we want to end up with elements that have half the number of elements that each have weight 2 to the L plus 1. If we think about an element that has even rank in the original list, then the rank with respect to, the, to that list is going to be 2i for some i times 2 to the L where 2 to the L is the number of elements represented by each element. When we do the compression step, the rank is going to remain the same. It's still going to be uh, i times 2 to the L plus 1, both in the odd and the even numbered case. On the other hand, if the rank is odd in the sense that uh, we have an odd position in the, in the list, and then of course multiplied by 2 to the L, then we get different ranks in the two cases. So if we choose the even numbered things uh, in the compression step, we are going to get a rank of i times 2 to the l plus 1. And if we choose the odd numbered case, it's going to be i plus 1 times 2 to the l plus 1. 
So both of these are wrong. One is slightly too small, one is slightly too large, but on average they're exactly correct. So now the idea is to choose this at random. Then we are going to get the correct thing in expectation. So the general picture for KLL is as follows. So we have our H plus one levels of buffers. Let's call them B0 through BH. And remember that at level L, each element represents two to the L input elements. To get an estimator for the rank of X, we simply sum up estimators for the rank represented by each level. So we sum over all levels and we take the number of items at that level less than or equal to x weighed by 2 to the i for level i. And because of the unbiasedness of uh, the compaction step, this is going to be an unbiased estimator. So far, I only told you that the size of the buffers are going to grow geometrically, uh, but we need to specify exactly what size the largest buffer should be. And here we introduce a parameter k and ask that the largest buffer has size k divided by c to the h, where c was this parameter between one half and one. And we'll talk about how to set k later. So now we're interested in the difference between the estimator for the rank and, and the rank itself. And we can think about this or express this, this error in terms of all the errors made in the compaction step. So here we use ML to denote the number of compactions happening at level L. And the random variable XIL to denote the, the error or the sign of the error at the ith compaction at level L. So this could be plus one if the positive error, if there's a positive error of two to the L or minus one if there's a negative error of minus two to the L. So the total error is, is exactly this, this sum. And this looks a lot like uh, the kind of things we have seen how to bound using uh, Chernoff bounds. And what we need in this case is a slightly different variant that I didn't talk about before, but it's, it's in the book. So let me just uh, state the special case we need here. So we have a bunch of independent random variables. All of them are bounded. So by some value AI could be different for, for each of them. And we look at uh, the sum of these random variables, assuming that the expectation is zero. So now the probability that the absolute value is greater than k is exponentially small in k squared. And the number we need to divide k squared by is the sum of the square of all the AIs multiplied by two. So this is fact one four from the book basically, or a special case of that. Now let's go back to the sum we wanted to bound. So here the two to the L takes the role of AI in the, in the lemma. So we, we need to bound the sum of all the AI squares. So that's this sum where we have two to the two L in each of them. And we can rewrite this as uh, ML multiplied, to, multiplied by two to the two L. So that's, remember that's the number of compaction operations and I, I claim that we can bound the number of compaction operations by two over C to the H minus L. So this is a claim we are going to get back to later. And now we have a sum that is clearly dominated by the last term. So that's because for each, each time L grows, this grows by a factor of more than one. So it's a geometrically increasing sum and it's dominated by the last term. So this is O of two to the two H. Now let's, uh, denote the error by x, probability that x is more than epsilon times n. We can upper bound that as being exponentially small in the deviation epsilon n squared divided by the sum of ai squared, which is uh, two to the two h plus one. Okay, and now I'm going to claim, so this is the second claim that we need to substantiate that two to the two h plus one can be upper bounded by four times n over k squared. So if you believe that for a minute, the whole thing is going to be exponentially small in k squared divided by four epsilon squared. Okay, so we'll get back to this claim number two uh, on the next slide. But before that, let's see that we achieved what we wanted to. Um, 
So if you look at this, it's enough to choose k such that this fraction becomes um, larger than log 1 over delta. So, and to do that, we just need to choose it to be 2 times square root of log 1 over delta divided by epsilon. That gives us error probability delta. Now, before we move on, I would like you to think about what the kind of delta suffices if we want a good rank for all queries. So in particular, we want ranks that are accurate within epsilon n for all queries. And I claim that this we actually get this with probability, which is delta divided by epsilon. So let's consider the first of the two claims, saying that m of l can be upper bounded by 2 over c to the h minus l. We're going to do induction on h minus l. If h minus l is 0, we are considering the highest level h, and there have been no compaction whatsoever, so m of l is actually 0. So it's clearly true. So in the induction step, and I'm not going to be completely formal here, um, let's suppose that we actually have know that m of l has the, the right upper bound, and then we want to increase, uh, consider level, the level before level l minus 1. Um, and let's consider one, one level. The output of all the compactors uh, of that level is the number of compactions times the buffer size divided by 2 beta because we do the compaction. So we can write that. Uh, so this is equal to number of compactions times c over 2 times act the buffer size on the, on the next level. And since we only do compactions when a buffer is full, this gives us a, an upper bound on the number of compactions at level l plus 1. Now consider m l minus 1 should be l minus 1 on the slide, we can upper bound that by m of l times c over 2, and then by the induction hypothesis, this is upper bounded by the, the claimed amount. Finally, let's look at claim number 2. So we claim that 2 to the 2h is upper bounded by 4 times n over k squared. There are two facts we need to, to show this. First of all, at level h minus 1, each element corresponds to 2 to the h minus 1 input elements. Also, we know that at least k times c input elements have been at level h minus 1 because it was full at some time and we made a compaction and created level h. Using these two facts together, we get that kc times 2h minus 1 must be at most n. And this implies in a couple of steps, that 2 to the 2h is at most 16 times n over k squared. So here the constant 16 is not what was promised, but it can be improved to 4. You can see the book for details. To wrap up the analysis of KLL, we need to analyze the space usage. The space is the size of all the buffers combined, and buffer L had size c of h minus l k plus a constant and which we can ignore. So, and if we sum of all of these, because we have a geometrically increasing series, it's dominated by the last term. So the size of the large buffer, which is k. So all in all, we get something that's O of k, where the constant depends on the choice of c. KLL supports merging. So given two KLL summaries, we can merge them into a summary of the union of data sets. And merging pretty much works like insertion. So we kind of uh, push things up. So we start with level zero, merge the two, or, uh, two, two buffers. If they overflow, we do a compaction and push up and so on. Um, so that's merging. Uh, all of this is time efficient. And this is because in expectation, each input is thrown out after being in just two compactions. Every time it has 50% chance of being thrown out. So this means that the expected time we spend on each input element is constant. From a theoretical point of view, it's possible to slightly improve the space usage of the KLL sketch as we described it. Specifically, it can be improved to be O of 1 over epsilon times log log of 1 over epsilon. So very close to the space lower bound 1 over epsilon. It's going, however, it's much more complicated and also 
the sketches are not known to be mergeable. So there's a nice open problem there.